Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sang buddhasa namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sang buddhasa namo tasa Bhagavato arahato sama sang buddhasa buddhang tamang sanghang namami. Let us share the collective merits of this samadana with all our parents, teachers, family, friends and all sentient beings. May all beings be well and happy. Namo Buddhaya. Good morning, everyone. Today, I am alive and light. So you can see me <laughs> on your screen. So wave to me if you can see me. Very good. So I see a lot of very happy faces. So wonderful to see everyone. And I hope all of you are keeping your mind, uh, your body healthy and the mind peaceful. And as Sister Ali said, uh, let us uh, listen without delusion today on this topic that we are going to discuss. So friends, for the past um, six weeks, we have been following the series based on the Chulla Purnama Sutta, which is uh, from the Majjhima Nikaya, the middle, uh, Middle length uh, discourses of the Buddha, Sutta number 110, which is called the Discourse on the Full Moon Night. And it talks about a person of integrity, a sub purisa. So today we will conclude the series. It is the seventh week, and we will conclude this series. And today we will discuss a little bit on the last bit of what the Buddha has said that is on what makes a person a true person in regards to giving. But before that, let us again refresh our memory on what we have learned over the past six months. We may have forgotten because it's six months plus six weeks. So it is um, uh, quite a long time. So let me just refresh all of us so we can rejoice together. So we learned about uh, how a person of integrity has faith, moral shame, fear of wrongdoing, is learned, energetic mindful and wise. So you can also uh, ask yourself, am I all of this or am I in the course of, of uh, walking this path? Then one who is of integra integrity associates with person of such qualities. He does not think for his own affliction, for the affliction of others or for the affliction of both. He does not counsel for his own affliction for the affliction of others or for the affliction of both. A person of integrity abstains from false speech, malicious speech, harsh speech and gossip. He also abstains from killing living beings. He does not take what is not given and he abstains from sexual misconduct. And he holds a view such as this. There is what is given what is offered and what is sacrificed. There is fruit and the result of good and bad actions. It means he believes in the law of karma. There is world, there is this world, and there is the other world. It means there is rebirth. Once we die, we are born again. And there is mother and father, spontaneous born beings, meaning there is heaven and there is uh, lower realms. And there are also realized beings who have already attained to this stage where they have seen it for themselves. So uh, now that we have learned all this, let us now go on to our topic for today. So friends, in our worldly existence, we all experience many, many happy events and things in our life. We all fall in love. I hope so. We have all fallen in love, right? And then we bring up our children, we have successful careers and businesses, we go on holidays, we have a home, we have money in the bank. And there are times 
But there are times when things don't go our way. And sometimes we meet with a lot of intolerable challenges. For others, life is a misery and full of difficulties. However, life goes on. The Buddha was the only spiritual teacher to point out that we are all in this samsaric cycle of existence, in this vast ocean of repeated birth and death. We are all pushed by the waves and we are pulled by the currents in the vicissitudes of life, sometimes having pleasure, sometimes having pain. Sometimes we have gained and sometimes we have lost. Sometimes we are praised, sometimes we are blamed, and sometimes we have pain, and at other times we are also depraved. So in these vicissitudes of life, we are all drifting aimlessly and we got nothing to hold on to. But if we learn the, uh, the teachings of the Buddha, the goal of the Buddhist practitioner is this freedom from suffering of repeated existence in samsara when we hold on to the teaching, to the teacher and also to the uh, sangha members. We know that we have something to hold on to. We don't have to drift aimlessly. So friends, living with integrity, life and integrity means we are actually stepping, we're taking a step to help us cross this ocean of samsara. And living a life of integrity means not just Dhamma learning, we hear and we acknowledge, we read. It's not just that, but it takes a lot of courage, effort, and determination. Once we have established integrity within ourselves in the mind continuum, it creates, you know, this, this integrity will go on in our future life. So it'll become easier and easier. And not only in this future, in this lifetime, but in future lifetimes, we will also have this seed of integrity already in us. And we can see that even we, as we listen to the Dhamma today, we already have this seed. That's why we are all practicing dana, sila, and bhavana. So let me give you a simile to illustrate actually what is this living a life of integrity. Because when we talk about it, it's very hard to imagine. Huh? So I will, uh, uh, there is a picture of how we are trying to maintain a meticulously clean house. And then while living in it, in this house that uh, we are living up uh, with a lot of young children and a lot of teenagers. So you can imagine uh, how messy the house can be. Uh. So it's so complicated, so many things to do, so many uh, things that we have to pay attention to. So what it takes is that we need time, we need attention, and we need energy to live a life of integrity. It's not just mere knowledge. So sometimes it's so complicated, it's so difficult, it's so hard. Uh, that I am just let it be, uh, never mind. So you can see it's a messy house versus a clean house, how it looks like. So when we have integrity, it's very simple. It is hard work, but the payoff is uh, we can live a very fulfilling life. Making choices become easy and we are very confident we can make the right choices because we know exactly what to do, what we should do. So let us now look at the extract of the Chunda Purnama Sutta. Uh, from the Majjhima Nikaya 110 uh, uh, on what the Buddha has said about giving. So the Buddha said, and how a person of integrity is a person of integrity in the way he gives a gift. So there is a case where a person of integrity gives a gift attentively with his own hand. He gives it showing respect. He gives a valuable gift not as if something that is fit to be thrown away. He views that something will come out of it. That means there is this uh, law of karma. That means whatever we give, there is a corresponding result out of it. And this is how a person of integrity is a person of integrity in the way we give a gift. So let us now examine uh, more about uh, this passage that is in this sutta. So the practice of giving is the foundation and the seed of spiritual development for Buddhist deity. For us as lay people, we normally we start with dana, right? So somebody will invite you, hey, let's go and do dana, <clears throat> or let's go and help out in the uh, 
uh, triple F or let's go and do something, you know. So every time, uh, most of the time when we start our Buddhist practice, our learning usually starts with dana. So that is the foundation and seed of our spiritual development. Even the ascetic Sumida, when he had to fulfill the dana parami first by giving up, actually this uh, Sumida was a son of a very rich couple. They were very rich. Both the parents passed away and he was had so much of property, but he just gave up everything. He didn't want to uh, enjoy any of that property and he left everything. So he fulfilled the dana parami before he received the prophecy from Buddha Dipankara that he will be the future Buddha Gautama. So friends, giving is a remedy. It's a cure for our selfishness, self-centeredness, and self-importance. When giving, when we give with true understanding, what happens is it weakens that mental factor of craving, of greed, of delusion. And it leads to the accumulation of wholesome causes and conditions for our liberation. Giving also brings a lot of material and worldly benefits like good health, long life, wealth, status, fame, amongst others. So we can know from our own life how we are doing in terms of our dance. So in the, uh, when we want to learn about dana, actually it's a very a huge topic. There's so many uh, uh, things to look into dana. But today, for the purpose of our talk, I will talk about this classification of dana by way of group of two. That means it comes in a pair. This classification comes in a pair and it, it is regards the motivation or the intention and the volition of the giver. So there are these two types of dana, classification of dana, which is called, there are many classifications. So today I will just talk about these two, which is the first is called vatta mullaka dana. Vatta means cycle, go round and round in the cycle. Huh? It's a vatta means going round. It's a cycle or it means a period of time. Mulla means root or the cause. So there is a root cause for going round and round in samsara. That is called dana that keeps us entangled in the cycle of birth and existence. So that means we go around, we keep doing this kind of dana, we will come back into birth again and again and again. So this is called vata mulaka dana. The second is called vi vata mulaka dana. It's the same, but now what we do, it takes us out of the circle of, of, of dana. It doesn't mean we are doing different kind of dana, no. Is the same kind of the same dana, but it is the manner in which we are doing the offering or the giving. So when uh, we have bhakta mulaka dana, we are uh, whatever we do, whatever actions we do is always preceded by some kind of motivation, intention, or volition. So a donor, for example, may perform any act of giving, but if the intention of that donor or the giver is to show off, hey, look at me, man, I gave such a big donation. Or, or look at this, the fruits I give, so nice. You know, so this is showing off. Or we wish for worldly happiness, such as fame. We want people to recognize us. We want honor. We want prestige. Or sometimes it is for our profit, meaning you say, ah, I give this, ah, I hope next time ah, I have rich, I have enough food to eat, I have enough nice clothes to wear. So we have profit. That means it's, we are trying to profit from it and heavenly rebirth. So the mind is stained with attachment and craving. And such a mind which is rooted in desire remains in bondage. It is always bonded, always coming into rebirth. It brings you to rebirth again. and this kind of volition will prolong, it will just prolong our existence in this samsara world. On the other hand, the V Vataka, Vataka Mula Dana means it is the cultivating of the quality of liberality. We become open handed, chagga. We are very liberal in our giving. We give without expectations and attachments. 
As soon as you give, there's no more attachment to the gift. It is simply not about the physical act. It's not about the act of giving, but rather we develop this ability to care and to share. And most importantly, is towards our inward transformation, towards relinquishment. We relinquish slowly, but surely we let go of our worldly uh, the things, not only the things, but the attachment and the craving to them. So by doing this, we will naturally loosen the knots. We are all knotted up with this kind of greed, covetousness, hatred. And when we free ourselves from these knots, we actually feel very happy and more at peace within ourselves. And this eventually will pave the way for us to acquire that kind of essential wisdom towards realizing the, uh, liberation from samsara. So one who wishes to get out of this cycle of existence, we perform the Patamulatadana. So how do we do that? So this is what the Buddha said. We can start by giving attentively with both hands, showing respect. We give a gift which is valuable, which is timely, which is needed. And we know that when we give, something will come out of it. We don't have to wish for it, but we know that it will come. So let's look at the type of gifts that we give. That is, the first one is attentively, it's called Sakachadana. So before we give a gift, let's say uh, we offer it with reverence, respect, and also we believe in karma and its results. And the mind is joyful. So let, you, let me give you an example. I'm sure today many of you would have made offerings of flowers, right? So probably you would have plucked it from your garden or maybe you have got it from the market. So what do we do when we offer the flowers? We trim it nicely, we clean it, then we arrange it nicely, we put it into a nice clean vase, we wipe everything clean, and then we make it look as beautiful as possible, and then we offer the flowers with both hands. It's not like I'm in a hurry, I just don't put it on the, uh, on the what do you call the altar, and off you go to do something, but with a mind, the mental volition. When you offer with both hands, you stand and then you can always reflect. These flowers will wither and die. Very soon, uh, this beautiful flower will wither and die. This body of mine ooh, will one day uh, will wither and die. I will die one day just like this flower, no more beautiful. So may I too have the conditions and the urgency to practice the Dhamma. So you see the volition. Everybody puts flowers on the on the altar, but what is the mental volition that goes with it? Now, that is the most important when we do with attentiveness. We are very attentive to what we are doing. Another example, for example, if let's say someone comes and asks uh, to lend them some money, but actually they are very embarrassed because they don't do this, but sometimes their need is very, uh, you know, very urgent and they really don't have the money. And they want to ask you, but they also very pice when are you, how are I want to ask her. Then, but they come and ask you. And then as the giver, as the donor, when you give, you make sure that we give it, make sure that they don't feel humiliated, belittled, or hurt because they are already, their burden is already very heavy. So we don't make it even heavier by using un. Uh, uh, the attentiveness is not there. We are very uh, uh, kind in the heart to give it, and we give it away without any kind of judgment. Let's see another example. You know, most of the time, a lot of students will come around and then they will ask for a donation for their schools. Uh, I'm sure all of us also have done that. So we go, uh, they go walk a town, and then they come running to you and say, uh, Sister, sister, can you please give us uh, some uh, uh, donation we are collecting for our school? So did you realize at that moment, were you uh, kind of resentful or you are very grudging and you grumble, hey, every time also do a donation, uh, one money, this school is all useless. Or oh, are we saying, ah, wonderful, wonderful, I give. You may give a very small amount. It could be only just 10 ringgit, but the joy that you get that you say, ah, may the student progress in their learning. May they be successful in what they do. 
and may do you give encouraging words. So this is what we mean by giving attentively. That means whatever we give, we are there. It not only in body, but the mind accompanies the time. And one gives with one own hand. Here, when we give personally, it promotes the kind of rapport between the giver and the receiver. There is, you can see the care and the concern at that very moment of giving between the two uh, persons. And if we give with, the, with our own hands, don't forget, not the body is already doing, but the mind is accompanying that hand that is giving. So that mind has got that very strong potency to create that merit that will be of help to us in the future. And if we give it to an intermediary, if you ask your friend, hey, go and do that dana for me, go and offer the food. The friend just gives only. He doesn't think for you. Huh? So that's why the Buddha said, if possible, at all costs, give with one own sense because there is this mental energy that follows the giving. The third is when we have faith and we give with a lot of sata. Respectfully, we give with a lot of reverence, deference, and respect. And we delight in this opportunity to give because when we have this opportunity, it actually loosens again our knot of attaching on to things. We give away what belongs to us. And lastly, to give things that are useful and appropriate, na upper vitadana, that is, we only try our very best to give what is useful and what is appropriate. So to, to uh, what do you call that, um, summarize all these this, uh, few things that the Buddha has said, there's a very, very interesting story in the Diga Nikaya 23. It is Diga means very long discourse of the Buddha. So in this discourse, uh, there is a story about two uh, people, which is one is the governor of Payasi and the other is his friend Uttara. So what happened is there is this, uh, this uh, governor of Ayasi, he was actually a person who held wrong views, meaning he did not believe there was a rebirth after dying. And he said no such thing as a being reborn. And he did not believe in spontaneous birth. Since there is no rebirth, there cannot be heaven, there cannot be hell. He said, he said no such thing, right? Because there is, uh, uh, what do you call that? We don't have, so he doesn't believe in the other world. And he says there's no fruits of giving. Why did he hold this kind of views? Is because he had this argument to tell. Because he was having a discussion with Venerable Kumara Kasyapa. Now, this Kumara Kasyapa is not the same as the Arhan Kasyapa. This is another uh, monk. So he was having a discussion, but he held this view because he said, actually, why I say there is no other world is because I also have friends and I also have a family. And they, I know they are very bad people. They do a lot of evil. They kill. They steal. They, they, they are not good people. So when they were dying, I went to them and I told them, hey, friend, I said, when you die already, uh, if you go to hell, uh, you please come and tell me so I know that hell exists. But he said, until today, nobody come and tell me. So he said, that means there's no hell already. I mean, nothing, no rebirth. Makes sense, right? <laughs> then he said, at the same time, he said, also, I have family, I have friends who are very good. They are very kind. They are very generous, good people. And when they're dying, I also go and tell them, hey, friend, he said, can you please tell me uh, when you die already, uh, you please come back and tell me uh, whether you have gone to heaven. So I know there is heaven. And you know what? Until today, nobody come and tell me that they have gone to heaven. So you see, there is no afterlife. So that is his argument. So this venerable Kumar Kasipa was trying to uh, talk him out of it and explain to him. So it's a very, very long discourse and a very interesting discourse. And I encourage uh, all our friends here to actually go and read this when you're free after this talk. And so what happened is after a very long uh, protracted kind of a discussion, he finally agreed with uh, Venerable uh, Kumar Kasyapa. And then he said, okay, now I will give a big dana. He wanted to give a dana in honor of that 
uh, discussion he had with Venerable. So, but he said he, he wanted to give the dana, he gave all the money, he made all the, uh, what do you call that? But he gave instruction, he didn't do it himself. He asked his friend Uttara and said, you go and do everything. So Uttara is the one who arranged the dana, who did the uh, giving, you know, as though it was his own donation, with his own hands, he respectfully gave to every one of those people who came to receive that almsgiving ceremony. Now, what happened is, both of them died. Like one day they have to die, right? So where did they go? So both of them were born in the heavenly realms. But this governor of Payasi, he was born in the Chattu Maharajika realm, which is the realm of the heavenly kings, the four heavenly kings. That is the lowest. After Earth, that is the, the first heavenly realm. But this Uttara, he was born in Tavatimsa heaven, which is above Chattu Maharaj can have a, the realm of the, the three gods. So then one day there was this Arahan by the name of Gavampati. So this Arahan likes to go up to the heavenly realms to visit, uh, to see what the people are doing there, what are the devas doing there. And usually he used to go to this very, there was an empty mansion there and he used to go there and meditate but on this particular visit what happened is there was a deva occupying that mansion so it was a big puzzle eh? how come uh, now got people in this mansion so he approached the deva and had a conversation with the deva and this deva then told him actually he said venerable sir i was the in my previous birth i was the governor payasi and when I did my donation in my previous life, I did not make the offerings with due respect. He was not respectful. He did not make it personally. And he gave things. Uh, his offerings was what, you know, coarse rice, broken rice. And he gave the cloth. Uh, it's like a very rough kind of cloth. Uh, as the Uttara said, it's only fit to wipe. Even wipe the leg also can cut the leg. It was so coarse. So because he gave these kind of things, and as a result, he was born in this Chattu Maharajika heaven. Not only he was born there, but he was born in an inferior part of the heaven. He was all alone. No? There was not, not many people in that part of that heaven. And his mansion was empty in you know, awesome an And he did not enjoy the revenue, the retinue. You know, usually the devas have a lot of followers, a lot of servants to entertain them. But he had nothing. Whereas... His friend, Uttara, on the other hand, had all of the above. That means his mansion was filled with adornments and he had a very lavish mansion and he had many celestial servants. So he told the Venerable Gavampati, he said, Venerable Sir, when you go back to earth, can you please preach to the lay people about this, uh, this story of mine? Said, so that people... Uh, he, he said, admonish the people to make their offerings respectfully, personally with their own hand, and not to be callous, to give things as if it is only fit to be thrown away. So you can please read this in the Vegan Ikaya. I only give you a summary. There are many, many interesting arguments you had with the Venerable Kasipa. So you can read it in the Vegan Ikaya, Sutta number 23. So friends, again in the Anguttara Nikaya book of seven, the, the Buddha also gave this discourse. It's called the Dana Maha Pahala Sutta. It means when you give a Dana, whether you get very large or very beneficial fruits. So the, this background of the story is Venerable Sariputta, together with a group of his lay followers, they went to see the Buddha. And after paying respects, they sat down to one side and then they asked, Venerable Sariputta asked this question to the Buddha. He said, Venerable Sir, is it possible that someone gives a gift and it is not very fruitful or beneficial while someone gives exactly the same gift, but that gift is very fruitful and very beneficial. It's the same gift. But one giver, it is not very beneficial or uh, what do you call that, uh, fruitful. But the other person give is uh, more very more beneficial and more, well, how can, how is that so? So let's explore a little bit, friends. 
So the Buddha said, yes, it is possible. So the Buddha said, he gives a gift with as an investment. He thinks of it as an investment. Their minds tied to it, expecting to keep it thinking, I will enjoy this in my next life. So that means you give with expectation. You expect next life, I will have food to eat, la. I have a nice house to live, la. I got many servants. La. So you give with a mind tied to it and you have like an investment, uh, make profit out of your time. Then the second the Buddha said is, it is good to give. So some people give, uh, they say, yeah, it's good to give. Give, uh, give, it's a good one. That's all. They do not know what is this giving, what are the fruits of giving, how to give, when to give, who to give. They don't know. So they just give. So this is delusion. The first one is desire, based on desire. The second one is on delusion. The third is giving was practiced by my father, my father's father. It would not be right for me to abandon the family tradition. So sometimes the one who gives says, actually, I better give, you know, because he's very fearful. He gives out of fear, thinking if I don't give a half face, I got bad luck already. So he really cannot. So he go and give a gift because he does it out of fear, not because of understanding. And then another one. I cook. They don't. It would not it wouldn't be right for me not to give them. So again, there is attachment. I have, they don't have. In another sutta, the Buddha also says, I am well off, they are not. So you always see the difference between me and them. So there is this uh, division. So this again is also part of hatred, delusion group. Again, another one. The ancient Brahmins perform great sacrifices. Just as they perform a great sacrifice, I will share the gift. So that means, you say, if some people also give one, no, they give like that one. So I also must give one. So you compete with them and say, they give, they give, I also want to give. So it is not out of, uh, but so this is a desire, a desire to give with attachment. And then there's a sixth one, which says, when giving the gift, my mind becomes clear and becomes happy and joyful. A good word, is the paru. Mind is joyful, right? What's wrong? Why, why there's no fruit of that gift? It's not that. You see, because some people give, huh? they say, I'm so happy, you know, I give this gift. i so, you know, I feel very, very joyful, you know. You see, the attachment, do you see the attachment to that joy? When you give, huh? you're attached to that joy. Now, huh? you give the gift, but you become attached to the joy and that kind of uh, craving for that kind of joy and happiness. So that, again, it is still uh, craving. And the Buddha said, in all these six categories, the Buddha said, what happens is, on the breakup of the body, means when you die, he reappears in the company of devas. They still go to the heavenly realm because these are very good deeds they have done. That act is very good. But having exhausted that action, that power, that status, that sovereignty, he is a returner. He comes back to the world. You understand? So that means we go around in this circle, you give already, you go to heaven, then you come back to earth, then uh, like that, we go round and round because these are based on desire, on hatred, on delusion, on fear, and those kind of uh, rooted. So these are all Vakamulakadanas that we give with this kind of attachment. And the last one is the seventh, the Buddha said, Sariputta. Someone who gives a gift not for any other reason. But thinking, this is an adornment of the mind, a requisite for the mind. When their body breaks and after death, he is reborn. He is also reborn. The one who gives the same kind of gifts, but after he is reborn, what does it mean by an adornment, a requisite of the mind? It means that we are now letting go, relinquishing. We do not uh, attach ourselves. There is no expectations. We just give and we say, this is for the benefit of other beings and for the happiness of others. And we, and the Buddha said, they will be born in the Brahma realm, the host of the Brahmas. He will be a non-returner. That means they do not come back to this world. That means as slowly we cultivate ourselves, there will come a time when we will not come back to this world. So friends, all forms of giving can be accompanied 
whatever gifts we give, whatever giving we do, whatever dana we do, whatever generosity we have, it is all accompanied by three types of volition. Volition means the mental thinking and the chetana at that very moment when you do, what do we think? There are these three types of chetana, which is the puba chetana before we give and during the giving and after the giving, which is the first is called puba chetana. During it is called muncha chetana. And after we give, we also can reflect. It is called upper chetana. So what is puba chetana? The mind is free when we are preparing to give the, the offering. Or let's say somebody sends you a, a, a text message and says, hey, we need money. Uh, we are collecting donation for these COVID victims or we need uh, oxygen tanks and whatever. You know. So what do you do? The mind is free from this pride, selfishness, attachment. I uh, again I ask for money, you know, instead of thinking that is attachment, but it is free from all this. And the mind is delighted and cheerful. And when, mm -hmm. let's say, you're preparing to give a dana, to in, you refrain the family, the donor, refrain from any kind of quarrels or disagreement. We are not hesitant. When we want to give immediately, yeah, we take action, you know, we straight away we do, don't have, must give, but how much to give? Uh, uh, why, yeah? Uh, you know, we think a lot. So the Buddha said, uh, this kind of chetana is we when we are not hesitant, we decide we just go on with it. And that takes much pure and sincere thought. We are very sincere in our giving, and that is over chetana. So remember, when we are going to give anything, quickly look at your mind and see what kind of thoughts are going on. And while we give, at the moment of giving that dana or that giving or that generosity, it means we are already renouncing the uh, renounce and detachment in the act of giving. That is in this possession, it's no more in my possession, it's completely gone. The mind is elevated. There is no greed and there's no pride and there is no anger. And we can always have this kind of thinking. May the recipient, the one who's receiving this giving, may they be practicing sila samadhi panya and become the cause of happiness and peace for other beings. Because when you give, let's say you're offering to a group of meditators, so you build, give a group of meditators are meditating. So you see them putting in so much of effort, then in your mind, uh, you have this thought, may all these people who are putting in effort to do mental cultivation, may they be well and happy. And because they are cultivating, they become source of happiness to other beings. So we can have this kind of, thoughts while we are giving the, uh, the act of giving and also after we give the gift then we can also repeatedly mind filled with this kind of wholesome thoughts thinking that the recipient will benefit and gain from this standard and also we should also remember to have this kind of mental volition saying may the merits of this dana that I have done lead to the extinction of my mental defilements. And also, it supports me in my attainment of Nibbana. Because all of us need support for us to uh, attain Nibbana. The very fact that all of us are sitting here with the right conditions to listen this morning to the chanting, to the meditation, and now to the summer talk, is because, friends, all of us have this very good condition. We have absolutely good condition supporting us that we can sit here and listen to this morning's, uh, uh, what do you call that, event. There are many people out there thinking, uh, I'm going to end my life. My life is worthless already. There are many people crying at the cemetery. There are many people suffering in the ICU. But we have condition to be able. So these are the, uh, what do you call that, the conditions that is supporting us. So there is a sutta called the Aputaka Sutta, which there was a money lender. It is in the Samyutta Nikaya book of three, sutta number 20, where there was a money lender. He had died and all his property, because he did not leave any uh, heirs behind. He didn't have any children or anybody to give it to. So all the money went to the treasury, the royal treasury. So the king 
ask the Buddha, how come uh, this man, uh, actually he is so rich, absolutely rich, but then he behaves uh, like a very poor person, you know. He eats all the very, you know, the, the porridge. Every day he eats porridge with the, with the pickle. And then he lives in a broke house. His, his vehicle is also uh, like the cut, uh, it's like broken already. And then he does not wear any good clothes. So he did not have, his mind uh, did not uh, 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 propel him to enjoy. So the Buddha actually explained, you know why this money lender is like that? Because in his previous life, many lifetimes ago, he offered alms food. He asked his servant, he said, please give food to this monk. And that monk happened to be the Pachika Buddha, Hagarasiki. So after giving the dana, this man actually regretted. He said, hey, yeah, I shouldn't have given this food to like, this useless monk. Uh, I said, this useless person. I better I give to my servant. Uh, then they will serve me better. They will work for me harder. So he regretted, you know. And he gave, he didn't know that he actually given this dana to a Pachika Buddha. But because he had given this dana, he appeared in the celestial realm the heavenly realm for seven lifetimes consecutively for seven lifetimes that uh, he was born in the heavenly realm he enjoyed that and after that karmic uh, potency was finished of the celestial realms he came back to the human world and the buddha this is the buddha's telling the story and he was a money lender for seven lifetimes life after life he was born as a money lender in that very city of Stavati. And in the last birth, after that last seven birth, he went to the unfortunate realms. So why is that? Because of that regret. Because he gave the dana, he was born in the celestial realms and he enjoyed seven lifetimes. Because as a result of the regret, when he regretted giving the dana, he did not enjoy the sensuality, you know, the five strings of sensuality we call means he did not see good things, he did not enjoy good clothes, he did not eat good food, and even the taste. You know? So the result of him having murdered, and not on top of that, he even murdered his brother's only heir. Because he was so greedy, he wanted to get all the property, he went and murdered his brother's heir. And because as a result of that, he was born in the unfortunate realm. And on top of that, in that last birth, all his property, he got no heir already, ma, all go to the government. Of course, we call it the royal treasury, but today we call it the government. Bank Negara take all our money. So, in this case, we can see because of that regret. So, this story illustrates uh, we should not regret. When we give, that's it. Finished. We only think of the good. So, friends, we only talk about heavenly realms. So, what is it that we can benefit in this very lifetime? So, in this sutta, the Anguttara Nikaya, Book of Fives, Sutta number 34, there was this general, Siha. He went to the Buddha and asked, is it possible, Lord, to point out the fruit of generosity, visible, here and the now? Is it, is it possible that when we do something, that goodness will come to us in this lifetime? The Buddha said, yes, sure. He said, and he gave these five conditions, uh, five ways in which we benefit. It is visible, whatever good we do. So one who is generous is dear and charming to the people at large. So you find a person who gives, continuously gives a very charming one and very dear. People really, really like this person because they not only give with attachment, but really out of the goodness of their heart. They know it will benefit others. So if you are dear and charming, then you can know that you have been giving with that generosity. Yeah? So you can give yourself a pat on the back. Yay! So you see the dana sitting in front at the back of me, uh, like that. Huh? So good people, the Buddha said, people of integrity admire one who, who is generous. So if you're admired, ah, it's because you're generous. The fine reputation of one who is generous, a master of giving, is spread far and wide. Actually, it's true, you know, the other day, I, I, it came to my mind. I wanted to remember somebody who I know is very good. They call him Dana King. You know? I think some of you know. But I couldn't remember his name. You know? But I know he is the Dana King. 
So I had to call Sister Nandini. I said, Sister, what is that name of that person uh, who always gives the dung? And then she told me the name. Ah, you see? So you can see uh, the one who is a reputation, uh, he can go master of giving. Uh, so I cannot remember his name, but I can remember he gives a lot. Uh, he gives very generous. He's really a very wonderful brother. And then the Buddha said, when one is generous, he approaches an assembly of people confidently and without embarrassment. So he's very confident because of that generous nature. He has got nothing to hide because he already has these qualities and the goodness, goodness within them. And the Buddha said, finally, on the breakup of the body, a generous one reappears in the good destination in the heavenly world. So these are the benefits. So if you have done a lot of good dana without this attachment, number one, you will not be you will not go around in the circle of, of rebirth and, and most you can be born in the heavenly realm. There's also another story, very interesting story about this couple. It is the Dhammapada verse 116. And here there was this very old couple. They are very utterly poor. You know, They are so poor, they got only one piece of cloth, like a, a covering that they have to wear when they go outside. So what happens is they are very devoted lay practitioners of the Buddha. They were very devoted to the Buddha and the community of monks. So the wife will go in the morning, the husband will go at night because they got only one piece of cloth. So cannot two pillars go. So one day, this man was listening to the Buddha, at night he was listening to the Buddha's uh, discourses, giving a, a Dhamma discourse. And then he had this very urgent, you know, he, he felt, oh, I must give something, I must offer something. But he got nothing. He's so poor, he got nothing but he only got the rope. La. He said, if I give the rope, how? Ah? My wife got nothing. I also got nothing. How? La? He said, so his mind, he was very hesitant and his mind wavered. But towards the end of that night, he's, he said, he offered that cross. Whatever he said, I give. La. I don't care. La. He said, I'm so poor. Already. I die also. Never mind. At least I do something. So he gave the robe, you know, that only robe he had, he gave it, offered it to the Buddha, saying, I win, I win. And when the king personally heard this, he was also in the congregation, heard this man crying, uh, calling, uh, I win, I win. So he sent his messenger, actually, please go and find out why this man is shouting like that. And then they found out, and the king offered him another set. He gave him a new set of robes, uh, a cloth, a piece of cloth. Because you remember those days, uh, Friend, it's not like now, uh, you go and you can buy online, also you can buy whatever you want. Those days, cloth uh, is very, very rare. It's very hard to get because everything is handmade. Now, everything factory made, uh, you have tons of it. Uh, so you must think. So the king gave him one set. What he did, he, again, immediately he offered it to the Buddha because his mind was so filled with the kind of faith and happiness, the joy that arose in him. Uh, he straight away never think he gave it to the Buddha. Then the king gave him two. Again, he offered to the Buddha. So this went on until the king gave him 32 pieces of cloth. So what did he do? Did he give all 32? Tadala. So what did he do? He gave 30 to the Buddha. He kept one for himself and one for his lovely wife. So this is how when we want to give. So at night, you know, the, sir, uh, the monks, uh, they asked, you know, he said, Venerable Sir, he said, how come uh, this dana, he, this man I gave us so quick, the result of it was so fast and so quick. And the Buddha said, actually, uh, if this Brahmin had offered at the moment that his thought, uh, that thought arose in him, I want to give something. Uh, in fact, what his reward uh, would have been much, 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 much greater. But because he wavered, uh, then he only received 32 ropes. Uh, I don't know what he would have received. Uh, but so let us remember the learning from this sutta is we must make haste in doing good without hesitation. So don't hesitate. Uh. If, we, if the, the thought arises in your mind, uh, oh, this is good, I must do, immediately do that good deed. If one procrastinates, then whatever the reward comes to us, uh, it is very slow and very sparing, you know, very hard to come on. So sometimes you see how uh, we have difficulties because very slow, you know, like very hard, like block type, very hard to come on. And if one thing is too long, what happens is the mind will take you away and then you forget about the dana. You say, oh yeah, I wanted to donate or close already or how? 
So you see the mind already take you away. So friends, when we give without attachment and expectations, then it is an adornment and a requisite for the mind. Remembering that we let go of our attachments and we uh, get Kusala Kama to support us in our future life. So friends, remember whether we have grains, wealth, silver, gold, or whatever other belongings we have. We have slaves, we are servants, errand runners, and dependents. You must go. When we go, we take none of it with us. We must leave all of them behind. But whatever you do with your body, with your speech, with your mind, that is yours for the taking. Taking that you go is your follower like a shadow that never leaves. Thus, we should do what is fine as a stash for our next life. Acts of merit are the support for beings in their afterlife. So remember to do every bit of dana. And may I remind you that every one of us who are sitting here listening attentively is actually, you are already doing tamadana. You are already in the act of tamadana, doing kusala kamadana. So rejoice within my friends. So in conclusion, uh, I want to conclude this session by reminding that uh, we have over the past six weeks, and today is the seventh week, we have been learning uh, deeply on the series of the Chula Purnama Sutta, the discourse on the full moon night on a person of integrity. So the Buddha gave this discourse to, uh, remember, to remind us that one a person, difference between a person of integrity and a person who has no integrity. Friends, integrity requires uh, a lot of courage to be integral. We need a lot of courage in our way we uh, live our lives. And it is difficult. Sometimes it can be very complex, you know, because we have to make decisions uh, that can be very complex. And sometimes even very, very painful. So if we want to be integral, it is sometimes very painful you know, to make a decision whether we should do this or we should not do this. Is it good? Is, is it going to be hurting to others or to me? So we have to remember. So as a parent, when we are a parent, our integrity builds trust for those who are depending on us. As a leader, our integrity builds trust on those who choose to follow us. And as a friend, integrity builds trust that we will be there in times of need. So when there is no trust, there can be no trust without integrity. And integrity takes many, many years, even lifetimes to build. But remember, we can only take a few seconds to lose it. So I leave you, friends, with good thoughts. May the merits of this gift, of this Dhamma, be shared by all beings. May all our giving be fruitful. May all beings be well and happy. Namo 